So it is a huge honor for me today to be interviewing. Uh, I'm a huge fan of you, Aaron, Aaron Elliott. In fact, my dental office is on uh, Elliott Road, and that street, I assume, was named after you. because As long you, as it has two T's. You know what? I don't even know if it does have two T's. <laughs> I, I think it does. I, it look, yeah, I, I think it does. Uh, so there's Elliott with one T and Elliott with two? Every good Elliott knows that it's Elliott, two L's, two T's. It'll probably say that on my gravestone. Really? Okay. Well, um, you're a, you're you're an amazing woman, and I I, uh, I, I re I'm a big fan of yours. You uh, um, you're the the new breed. I, I got to tell you, Aaron, I'm a lot older than you. I'm 52, and uh, you're still in your 30s. And uh, when I went to dental school, uh, there was one girl in the senior class. And now, when you go into dental schools, 45% um, of this year's graduating class is women dentists. And I, I'm a big fan of women dentists. Uh, um, I love it because um, the thing I love the most about women in dentistry is that when you go around the world, when you go to poor countries and there's no money in dentistry, it's all women. And when you go to America, when you go into professions with no money, like teaching, it's all women. And I, I always feel that there's a hardwired genetic component that says women always do it for their heart for all the right reasons. And a lot of times men show up because there's a lot of money in insurance and banking and financing and as doctors or dentists in rich countries. And the women are always there whether there's money in it or not. And uh, so most people don't realize when they, they think that women are new to dentistry, that when you look at the 2 million de dentists around the world, over a million of them are women because in all the poor countries when you can't make any money in it, it's only gonna be women in uh, dentistry or teaching or whatever. So uh, the first thing I gotta start out with you is, um, when I was in high school, if you were a boy like me and had a 3.5, they told you to go to school and be a doctor or dentist. And if you were a girl with a 4.0, they told you to go be a nurse or a dental hygienist. And your mom was a nurse and your dad was a dentist. What made you follow your dad and not your mom? To be honest, I didn't even want to be a dentist. Where I grew, up, <laughs> I grew really? up in Southern California. I was not expecting that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Southern California, and my dad had a long commute on a crowded freeway, and so I never really hung out at his office. I wasn't really familiar with dentistry. Uh, but growing up in California, it's more about what you're going to be, not who you're going to be as a person. It's career. And because I did graduate at the top of my class and I like action and blood and guts, I wanted to be an emergency room doctor. Really? Yeah. Before the show came out. So. Before, oh, but before the show came out. Well, ER. there were so many. Oh, ER. That's ER, so funny. Yeah. You're giving away your age because I know. when you're my age, <laughs> there, was, uh, there was the paramedic. I think it was, I forgot the name of the show, but it was, you know, uh, an ambulance and the doctor. And then there was Marcus Welby. But, uh. Okay, so, so you wanted to be an emergency room physician. So, so what, what happened there? How did you go from ER to dentistry? Well, it's, it was my senior year. I was looking into colleges. I'm a big soccer player. And when I went to UCLA one weekend, which is my dad's alma mater, and I was born and raised a UCLA Bruin fan. And then I went to a small school in Western New York. and On a soccer the, scholarship? On a soccer scholarship. I I went there the next weekend and chose my, my path, which changed everything in my life, I believe. So when you went to the, the small um, college um, in New York, uh, Western New York, uh, to mm -hmm. play at a Christian college, Houston, Houston, Houghton, Houghton, Houghton College, Houghton college that's yeah. when you chose that you were going to be a dentist? Well, yeah. I, I met my husband, or soon-to-be husband, and, and realized that I wanted a family, and I needed a life besides my career. And dentistry... I fell in love with dentistry. It's, it, it comes out of my pores. I don't think I can really hold it back. And there's, we just have such a wonderful career and an opportunity to help so many people. So you and met your husband fr family. freshman year of college in Houghton? Yeah. And Houghton. Uh, in Houghton? Mm -hmm. Houghton College? What city is that in? Houghton, New York. It's, Houghton, in uh, it's in Amish country. I'll tell you, Southern California to Amish country in snow. It, it was quite a now, did you ever Did you ever go to an Amish dentist? I did had, not. That had no power tools or electricity. <laughs> I, I always wonder how that would work. Um, well, that, that, that's, that, that's an amazing story. So, um, so you decide you're going to be a dentist. And, and, and so when you met your husband, you realized you wanted a family. And uh, mm -hmm. so you didn't want the emergency room. I, I have to tell you, uh, my emergency room deal, my dad um, told me, you know, well, you're at Creighton. They have a dental school and a medical school. 
He said, make sure that you don't want to be a physician. Get it. So I told the, um, the 80 year old Jesuit priest there in my dorm, Father McGloin, and he says, well, then he goes, I'll arrange your, uh, you know, you get 15 hours a week of uh, the student work program. He goes, I'll put you over at Creighton uh, Med School, their St. Joseph Hospital, and I got stuck in the emergency room. And when you were done, the walk back to my dorm was at least, you know, 20 minutes because you had to walk underneath the interstate and across. I know exactly the, what you're talking cause, about. Cause, oh, oh, yeah, because you went to Creighton. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was in Swanson Hall. Which hall were you in? I was a married student. I lived in Bellevue at the time. Okay, now so it was it was called St. Joseph's Hospital, yep. right? Yep, yep. And I just remember that you know when I walked back, every time someone died, you know, like a car wreck. I, I and I'll never forget this one where when they brought her in, she was talking, and she was internally bleeding, and I didn't know it, and but they knew it, and you know she comes in and she's talking. And 10 minutes later, they pull a sheet over her head. And I, I, went, I walked back and I, I, was, I, was, I was tearing. I was crying. Mm -hmm. And then I walked in my dorm. My friends are, it was like Friday night at like midnight. And they're like, come on, Howard, we're going out. And let's go out and have some fun. And I'm just like, I just want to sit in my room and cry. And I just <laughs> thought, I, I, this is not a job. I, I don't like this right. job. And then in dental school at UMKC, there was a med school, True Medical Center East. And we had to do these rotations in the hospital. And one of them was in this pediatric cancer ward. Oh, and devastating. you were in there, I was in there for a week and all these little beautiful kids are dying. Mm -hmm. And they're big, and this one little girl, I'll never forget, she made me just break down and lose it. I said, I said, um, I, she said to me, she goes, I just want to go to sleep and never wake up. Mm. And I just thought, who could do this job? I want to go right. work on a molar. I don't want to work on a dying child. I don't want to see a dying mother in a car accident. So yeah, so bless you know those people that want to do that. That's more power to them. I, I actually have the most respect for pediatric dentists. If I had to do that or uh. shovel horse manure, I would <laughs> shovel horse manure for below minimum wage with no benefits before I'd be a pediatric dentist. So I'm really excited um, to have... You know, I, I, I hate it when my podcasts are all a bunch of male dentists and everything. And, and these women in dental school, they need more role models like you. And I can't think of a hotter rock star <laughs> role model than you because you're, you're crushing it. I mean, you went to a small town. You have a huge practice. You didn't go in with your father. He's in Seattle, right? Yeah. Uh, when I was away at undergrad, uh, my, my dad ended up at, I think, 52, selling his practice. That's how old I am. In Long Beach, California. Am I expecting a midlife crisis? Moving to Vancouver, Washington, and building from the ground up. He bought the property and built the building. And what's fascinating about that, I think he just knew that if he wanted to live longer and not die in traffic on the freeway, that he needed to make a life change. And fortunately, they gave me a forwarding address. It's a wonderful practice, and I had the opportunity to move back there, but we chose Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Now that so that's even a more amazing story because you didn't you didn't walk into a practice <clears throat> hand you by dad. Uh, no. you, you started you started a scratch practice in Coeur d'Alene where they have the Iron Man uh, in uh, six yeah. weeks. You need to come visit. Actually, yeah. it wasn't a scratch practice. I I joined another um, guy that has been in practice. He had been in practice for about I think eighteen years at the time, so it was pretty established. But we were in an old cruddy five op building, and there was no room for me. Literally, I worked Mondays and Fridays and Thursday evenings, and that's it. And I was the breadwinner in the family. My husband was a teacher, but the teaching jobs didn't come very easily. And I don't know if I, I don't think I could be contained to just two days a week. Like I said, it just oozes out of me. Two days a week would be hard to, to only do dentistry. So did little. you buy this practice or are you still a partner with this guy? About three years ago, I bought in. So I was an associate for a while, uh, but the beauty of it is like he gave me, he allowed me to have that ownership mentality. I was out doing the marketing and community events and community involvement, and I just really liked that aspect of it. So we really built this up, and about right, right when we shouldn't have, we bought some property and built a 10-op practice. Don't tell me. It was in 2008. Uh, yeah, I think we built it, yeah, 2007 or 8. Oh, my and God. Lehman Brothers collapsed <laughs> September 2008. Great timing. I mean, I, I was getting to become a master at Sudoku because in between patients, 
that's what I did. And it was, it felt deserted, but you know, it's kind of that one of those things of if you build it, they will come or having, after listening to Dr. Blatchford's uh, podcast coming from a, coming from abundance instead of fear or scarcity, we kind of had that attitude and now we're out of room in 10 ops. It's a and wonderful ten, problem to have. So you bought the practice now. Is that guy still with you? He is. He'll be around for another 15 years or so. Yeah. Unless yeah, you start putting crushed glass in his Subway sandwich and it'll, it'll be shorter. He's about to be 50. He's 50. Well, that's, that's so old. I'm 52, so he'll probably be dead tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so that, that, that's amazing. So now, so you used to be the associate to him mm -hmm. and now he's the associate to you. Yeah. So, so oh, no, 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 no. I, oh, he's a partner. Partners. Okay. Yeah. He's, he's a partner in, in a 10 off. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so I, I want to back all the way up to the beginning, um, uh, not to be sexist or anything, but you are a, I can't think if I was going to go into a dental school class and it was 45% women and you've been out what, 12 years. Mm -hmm. And I was going to think, um, who, if you wanted to grow up to be like someone, I would say, you know, Aaron Elliott and, you know, um, right out of the gate. So my, my first question, uh, I, I want you to address, um, t tomorrow night, I'm going to the dental school ball graduation thing, uh, Thursday. Um, if you were giving the commencement ceremony and you were aiming at 45% of these women, um, what would your advice be to start their journey? And I want you to walk through your journey at a dental school because they're sitting in class, Aaron, and the first things they're thinking is there's nine specialties. Should I specialize? Mm -hmm. uh, there's residencies. Um, you got a job as an associate. Why did you pick that guy? But let, let's, let's go to the, the kids coming out of school. What would you say oh. at the commencement groups? What Should they specialize? Should they do a GPR? If they're going to get an associate, why did you pick the guy that you did? And did you pick Coeur d'Alene because of the, the right business reasons, demographics, or did you, with your brain, or did you pick that with your heart because that's just where you wanted to live because it's so damn beautiful there? That's about 20 questions, which I hope I can get to. <laughs> <laughs> well, take it away, Aaron. Well, first, if I were speaking to a graduate class, even male and female, what would be the motivation to specialize? Is it because you're passionate about that specialty? Or is it because you're going to make more money? For me, I didn't want to give up two years of my life. And I knew that I wanted to do it all. And especially now that I've discovered dental sleep medicine, I'm very happy I chose general dentistry. Uh, in addition, uh, gosh, you asked so many questions. I chose Coeur d'Alene because that's where we wanted to live. So your heart. If I, if I were thinking rationally, which I always do, I'm very cerebral that way and not very emotional, uh, it's where I wanted to raise my family. It has the best of all worlds. And at the time, when, in 2003, I mean, I found an affordable house on five acres. Uh, even though I worked two and a half days a week, we were able to live within our means. I, I did go travel and work at my dad's office every other week for two days. I'd fly to Portland and work. So it wasn't an easy decision because I only got two and a half days here. But I met with other dentists and no one really knew how to pay me, how to schedule me what they were going to do. When I walked in Dr. Lynn's office, it was kind of like, here's the contract. This is what you would get paid. And kind of what's mine is yours. And it worked out beautifully. Uh, I was just reading some statistics that I think it said in like 1980, less than 5% of dentists were women. And now the overall workforce, it's 27%. But the dental schools are graduating more and more. What's interesting was the corporate dentistry, how many more women they have there in the per, their percentage. They have about 46% women, that, which makes me wonder if, if that's the path that the women dentists are choosing after graduation so they don't have to manage and run a practice. Well, I'll tell you, there's a lot of demographic differences on women and the fact that um, look, look at the suicide rates. You know, we only, I, I can only find one woman that's committed suicide as a dentist and she had a whole history of mental illness and there's, you know, dentists have been in the top five for forever. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that, um, you know, uh, divorce is a third substance abuse, a third finance and a third sex. And men, dentists, always marry a woman who destroys $10,000 a month in capital. 
<laughs> and women dentists, thirty percent on marry a male dentist, but women dentists always marry a man with a job. And women dentists always marry a man that makes ten thousand dollars a month or you know has has, yeah. has a job. And and the difference between someone sitting at home destroying ten grand a month and someone bringing five to ten grand home, you know, is a whole different world of stress. It's I a also, different dynamic, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think when when people are out there earning money, they you know when, when you're not earning any money, you just like, well, I want a Gucci purse, so you go buy one for five grand. But when you're a dentist and you just had a, an incredibly rough day and you didn't even gross five grand and you got two thirds overhead and you come home and you find out the only thing your partner did today was buy a five thousand dollar Gucci purse <laughs> and get a mani pedi and wants a new car, it, it's it's incredibly stressful. So I I think women marry more with their brains. And men, you know, uh, and, and you see that across the entire planet. You see across in all cultures that men tend to marry down socioeconomic and women tend to marry up socioeconomic. So I, I, tell, I tell every, I've never lectured in dental school where I didn't tell the men the smartest thing they could do in dental school is marry one of the girls in the class. <laughs> that would be my first per, prerogative going into dental school. Not, not am I going to specialize, it's which one of these girls am I going to marry? That would just be... You know, and did you know if a dentist, if a dentist physician lawyer marries a dentist physician lawyer, they have the lowest divorce rate measured in the United States. It's single digits. It's like eight, one study says 8%, one study says 9%, but for the country, it's half. And, and whenever I see these guys bitching about how much student loans their debt is that they graduate with, I'm like, dude, your first divorce will cost you three times that money. So, uh, so yeah, so I think, I think women can easily say, I'm fine with corporate America. And, and by the way, corporate yeah. America is such a bad name because every dentist I've ever heard that says he hates corporate dentistry is a corporation, is an LLC. He, he's in corporate. It's like, it's, Technically, yes. That, that, that's but like, we have a lot of autonomy. You know, I get to write stuff off and I get to be a business owner and make decisions. And I think you lose some of that with that. Uh, I do have to say I, I was married when I entered dental school and definitely married for love. I married a PE teacher. But I, and I was going to um, touch on the student debt and people complaining about that. My first question would be, well, did you, max, did you take out every loan you could, every dollar? Oh, hell yeah. I, they, they all go to the Caribbean on, on spring break. Yeah. I, I was a valet a beer cart girl and a tutor. That's a little bit of a dichotomy there, but I worked and my husband worked and we lived within our means. I drove a crappy little Honda Civic and then I didn't take out all the loans. I also didn't, I lived in Omaha, Nebraska, not New York City. So I made some decisions based on that because I'm very frugal. Some would say cheap, but I just don't, I don't spend a lot and don't like to be in debt. Well, it's funny because if you saw a hundred Mercedes Benz in Scottsdale, ninety percent of them would all be leased and uh, and have mm -hmm. a five year mortgage on it. And it's funny because um, you fake it till you make it. Because people that are truly rich don't have don't wear Rolex watches. I don't right. I don't wear a watch, and my Lexus has one hundred and seven thousand miles on it, and it's ten years old. And I didn't have a car the first uh, the all of undergrad and the first three out of four years of dental school. I, I walked. And well, now, I, now I see these people complain about student loans and they're driving a $30,000 yeah. car. Well, I, I got my first new car last year because I was just tired of having lemons. So I had, I was the probably youngest person in my county driving a Buick rendezvous. In fact, I just, I just parked in the handicap spots because they figured they'd assumed I was old and decrepit anyways. But I finally got my first new car, but it, I had been a dentist for 10 years. And I'm still paying on my student loans, but I so, just so, live so, within my needs. So the the biggest takeaway so far is that dent doc, you know, when you're when you're stressed out of your mind and you're living in too big a house and too nice of cars and and every time you want to recharge your batteries, you fly to Hawaii for a week. I mean, quit spending money. It's the same, you know, Warren Buffett always says that about CEOs. He says 95% mm -hmm. of CEOs spend their entire day learning how they can raise their overhead, spend money they don't need to spend, and just complicate everything. And he said only about 5% of CEOs truly go to work and say, how can we do this faster, easier, lower cost, higher quality, and drive down cost and increase sales and make a ton of money? And just like Dennis, yeah. just always, always go to courses and seminars of how could I go into more debt 
and figure out how to do this the most expensive <laughs> way on the planet and solve a problem that no patient has ever asked for? Well, I'm all about efficiencies and systems, and there's a lot. I mean, I just got back from the IDS in Germany. There's a lot of sexy technology, but is that going to increase my efficiency and production, or is it just going to increase my debt? Okay, and no, those are I a lot of the questions I ask. When, when I heard that you were going to the IDS, I thought to myself, because I've been to the IDS a lot, but I mean, for an American to go all, oh, so, so the Americans, basically the United States has got 50 states, they all have a state meeting, there's way too many meetings, it's very fragmented. Europe basically has one big blowout every other year, and it's in Cologne, mm -hmm. Germany, and like 110,000 dentists come from every single country on earth. And um, basically, I mean, I've been there several times. There's not many American individual dentists there. And when I heard that little old Erin in her 30s was there, <laughs> I was saying, what was that about? What made you go to Cologne, Germany? I think it's a, it was an awesome opportunity to see the world and see dentistry at its best. Uh, there wasn't CE there, so really a lot of it was for industry, it felt like, more than anything. Well, can we talk, but, ab can we talk about that for a second? Because that's mm -hmm. a little nuanced thing that I didn't pick up till I'd been there the second or third time. The Americans' uh, dentists are extremely cynical. So like, like 3M and like Ivoclare each have like 60 PhD organic chemists and white lab coats that know everything about bleach uh, bonding in the resin and mm -hmm. an American dentists won't listen to them because they're like, well, they're, they're selling something for a profit. Dude, what are you doing? Are you giving away <laughs> free crowns? Are you, are you giving away free dentistry? I'm pretty sure you make a profit too. And it's just this stupid mentality. So then you'll go to a lecture and listen to some dentist who couldn't even go to the whiteboard and write down the organic chemistry model of the resin, the bonding, and it's just feigning expertise and doesn't know his ass from second base. And when you go become friends with these organic chemists, they go over the lecture notes and just butcher it. Like, how could these idiots say this and, and blah, blah, blah. And it's just crazy. But when you go to Europe, they don't have that, um, that stupidity in their brain. And a European will go to the booth. They don't have lectures at this meeting. 110,000 right. people. And it's so big, you couldn't even, at a walking pace of natural walking around the block, you could not walk by every booth in five days. Could you? No, I wore yeah. comfortable shoes, and I did find your booth, though. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so big. But a European yeah. dentist, he would rather or she would rather speak to the CEO of the company and say, Sir, will you tell me about your product? And America's like, oh, you can't listen to that guy. He's a whore. He's selling something <laughs> for money. He's for profit. And, and, then, and, then the, and then it's the same guy who doesn't believe in government and believes that, you know, free enterprise rules, but he won't even listen to free enterprise. So Americans, I think, get horrible information because they go to intermediates between the company and listen to lecturers who don't have who have no idea what they're talking about compared to 60 men in white coats who have PhDs in polymer chemics, organic chemistry, all this stuff like that. Europeans, they have trust. And they go there, right. they don't distrust their government. In, in Denmark, in Norway, in Sweden, in Switzerland, they don't have this anti-government where get an M16 because the tanks are going to be coming next week. And they listen to the manufacturers and the manufacturers. So they have all these little mini little booths and, and they, they want to talk to the owner. And, and they're always, there. Yeah, and they're there. And I've yeah. always enjoyed hearing about Ultradent from Dan Fisher, from hearing about mm -hmm. Denmat from Bob Ibsen, uh, from hearing, you know, I, I love to go talk to Buddy Moppert, who owns Cosden. I love to talk to um, these dentist CEOs, and, and, and I believe them. I don't sit there and say, hey, come on, Dan, you're selling something. You're a whore. I'm going to go listen to a lecture talk about Ultradent products. I, I'd rather listen to Dan the man Fisher about his own company. So that, that's a weird deal. So yeah, that is a very neat meeting to go to. By the way, I've met a lot of millionaire dentists in the United States from that meeting. Um, they go there, they saw a rockin' hot new implant that was from Russia or Israel or Turkey or whatever, find out they don't sell in the United States, pay $1 for the US distribution rights and say in five years, if we're not doing a million dollars a year, I give you back uh, the distribution rights. But if I can clear these economic hurdles, it's mine. And some of the biggest products I've used in the last 28 years has been from someone like you who went to IDS, saw a rockin' hot product made in another country, maybe Korea, and, and they, they, at, at that part of their growth cycle, they, they didn't have the money to have an office in the United States or Australia, or whatever. It's, it's, it's a rockin' hot meeting. Well, so, I think there was like 260 implants. I mean, it was yeah. so overwhelming, so overwhelming. And I think we have some of that here where it's like, what is best? 
you know, and, and I, I talked to my rep a lot from Henry Shine for advice. And I let my reps in the office all the time. My reps love me because I actually come out and talk to them. But I need to learn about these products. So let's go back to the dental school gra- gra- um, yields. I love your advice on specialties. Don't, don't specialize. Don't give up two years life because you think you're going to earn some more money. You know, is this specialize if that's where your passion is. If you just mm-hmm. truly only want to do pediatric dentistry, then go to pediatric school. But don't do it for any other reason. Um, what about a GPR? <coughs> you know, I think that would be fantastic. The thing for me is I felt at Creighton that I got a ton of experience. We didn't have specialists there. So right. I was able to experience, and um, we did a lot of different things and, and work. No matter if you go to a GPR or go straight into practice, it's still the practice of dentistry, right? Dental school tries to prepare you as much as they can, but you're still practicing dentistry. And I've, I felt prepared. I wanted to settle down. I wanted to start my family. Uh, that's another thing. I waited until dental school was over to start my family. And I obviously know the number one reason you moved to Coeur d'Alene is because that's where the Ironman is every year, and it's in five weeks. Are you ready to go swim your two and a half miles, bike 112, and then cool down with a 26.2-mile marathon? Well, not everyone may get this joke, but you can imagine how many triathletes live in my town. So I tried to do triathlons for a while, and then I realized how much I hated it. I'd rather run after a bouncing ball for 90 minutes. And so I got my first bumper sticker ever, and it says 0. 0.0. <laughs> 0. 0.0, that is awesome. Because 140.5 is the Ironman and 26.2 is the marathon, yep. and yours is 0. 0.0. Well, I learned to become a runner very um, young because I always had sirens behind me and uh, was running across the park. <laughs> That's a sprinter, though. That's a sprinter. Okay, so um, so um, – you do. Um, so what type of dentist you do? Do you, do you place implants? Do you do molar endo? Um, you talked about sleep apnea. We'll get to that. But what, tell us your mix of clinical dentistry. Well, I'll tell you, I, I'm very blessed by having this partner because we, we never really close our doors. Very rarely do we take an entire week off. And having someone here that I'm not always on call for emergencies and having while I'm on vacation, I can actually have someone here to take care of my patients. So that's a blessing. But in addition, we each kind of have our little niches. I could go take an implant course, but he does those, and he really likes them. And he just took Doc's sedation course. And I kind of do general dentistry, crowns, fillings. We do a lot of dentures and extractions still. And recently, uh, I do six months smiles and Invisalign. But more recently, my practice has become about... 60-40 60-40 dental sleep medicine. 60% I do dental sleep medicine. My, my part of it. Yeah, your part. Yes. 60%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I got to stop you right there. Um, how did that happen? This is 2015. When did your sleep medicine journey begin? Was it when About- your husband was uh, snoring so loud in the middle of the night? You, you, uh, you had to almost suffocate him with a pillow? Or what, what made you get into this? I'm going to have to admit it's me that snores. It's you. (laughs) And there's video to prove it because I didn't believe it. Uh, Is it on YouTube anywhere? What do I search? (laughs) Aaron Elliott's secret videos? Snoring, yeah. Uh, I actually have always, I've I've been accused of being like an old lady because I would put myself to bed. I never stayed up late. I would take my own naps. My parents never had to worry about me sleeping because I love to sleep. And when I found out about, you know, I was at the Idaho State Dental Convention and I heard a sleep physician speak in the morning and then a dental sleep medicine um, dentist in the afternoon. And I knew immediately that I wanted to pursue this. So that was, that was in 2009. But it, that was 2009. Now, after those mm-hmm. lectures, um, did you think you had sleep apnea? Uh, I thought I, I mean, had did you? Did you think I you thought had, I had narcolepsy? <laughs> you thought you had narcolepsy, so you were you were falling asleep. You're 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 getting sleepy during the day. You were well, when, when, I, when you should I, be awake, awake. You were tired. Yeah, I never really like, fell asleep in class or anything like that. But I I don't drive more than an hour because I'm gonna fall asleep at the wheel. So I I just know myself, and I didn't start snoring until more recently. So did you, do you have sleep apnea? Did you have sleep apnea? No, I've oh, tested you- myself and I wear an appliance when my husband's around to actually hear me snore. 
Yeah. So, so it, who, it who gave the, who gave the sleep um, apnea? Uh, who's the sleep dental in uh, 2009? Do you remember who that was? Uh, yes, it was Jameson Spencer because he's out of Spencer. Boise. Well, shout out to him that he uh, the, that, 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 that's a, a huge uh, turning point in your life is that one guy's lecture. That, that's amazing. So, so what what made you? Uh, and by the way, I, I when I heard my first sleep uh, medicine deal, um, I went and. Um, I went to a facility where you, you go to the bed, the mm -hmm. take home device. I've, I went take, to the I've done one of those too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, everybody said, you know, yeah, how are you going to sleep with all these cords or whatever? But you know, I, I just went there and you get in your underwear and they taped all these things to you. And I laid down with all these strings on me. It didn't bother me. I slept. And the guy said the next day, um, he said, I can't officially tell you you have to get a report, you know, illegal. I said, well, screw the lawyers. You know, I'll get the report. What, what do you think? He goes, he said, seriously, dude, you sleep deeper than 99 out of 100 people. He said, you are the least sleep apnea person planet. Wow. Uh, but so my first question to you is, um, should they buy a, a, a take-home device for their patient to see? Or do you refer these people to an uh, outpatient clinic to sleep all night to see if they have sleep apnea? Walk, walk, us, walk us through why you got interested and how you find patients coming in your office with sleep apnea and do you send them home with a box to do it themselves? Do you send them out? Just walk yeah. us through the whole, I'm going to shut up. <clears throat> I'm going to shut up and you just take it away on sleep. Because there's there's not a dozen dentists in America that have 60% of their practice of sleep medicine. That well, I know of. That I and know it's, of. And it's 0% endo, which makes me very happy. Uh, but when I took Kent Smith's course, uh, it's a two-day course. And, Kent Smith. Is he from yeah, Kentucky? It, Dallas. Kent Smith from Dallas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And he's a wonderful mentor. So that was two days. I went by myself. Actually, I went with my dad, but no team members. So then I come back all excited and I'm trying to say, okay, we're going to implement this. This is what we're going to do first. I got all my forms and it was very slow to take <coughs> off. I w decided that I was going to charge the patient up front and then they could try to get their medical insurance billed themselves. So I did maybe two a month, maybe. And it was all people, I did not own a home sleep test. It was all people that were already diagnosed. And I did some advertising. I went and spoke to physicians, visited the sleep labs. I hit the, I hit the pavement, which you have to do, really. And when it was finally, I, I finally decided to bill medical insurance. And that's where it took off more and more. But th even then there was some hiccups along the way. So that's why when I teach or speak to other sleep or dentists trying to get into this, I said, just learn from my mistakes, five years of my mistakes. And that is not having the entire team trained, not delegating what you can to the entire team and learning the ins and outs of medical billing. And well, ever since that happened, I, I mean, I okay, have been so established. Team medical building. Mm -hmm. What was the other one? Uh, having the entire team, the Medical billing and delegating what you can. Well, I, I, I'm just going to tell you that every speaker uh, that I've known personally for, for 20 years always says that when, it, when you go to go to lecture, say there's 200 people, the right side of the room is 100 people because it's 20 dentists who brought all their staff. Mm -hmm. And the left side of the room is 100 dentists all by themselves. And you can go pick up the 1041 incomes from all the people who bring all their staff. And it's all million dollar practices with dentists taking home three, 400,000 a year. Right. And then the guys on the other side are all saving money. They all come alone and they're all just barely getting by because dentistry, you have to be very egocentric to think that it's all you. It's, it's your assistants. The most important people is the ones answering your phone. The hygienists are in there for an hour and, and the dentist, uh, the online CE, I know dentists who said, Oh yeah, I've taken every one of your courses. Then they go, well, actually I didn't. It's just that, you know, we have staff meetings and I just play one every week <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm back in, you know, so yeah. So, so that, that's a he's huge on dental lesson. Town posting. And, and by the uh, way, by the way, if 60% of your practice is uh, sleep medicine, God dang, I hope you create an online CE course for dental town and walk us through everything you've learned on your trials and journeys. That would, that would be amazing. Yeah. Well, my whole focus and, and, hopefully inspiration is actual implementation. I once had a, a friend teased me and he said, I think you're going to have to move from Coeur d'Alene soon. And I said, why? He's like, I think you have everyone in town in appliances already. And it's not that it's just that we're screening them. We're, we're creating value in it. You know, our, as far as our communication goes, 
I, I, we track all our numbers. We monitor everything because numbers tell a story. Am I treatment planning enough? Do we have good case acceptance? My case acceptance is through the roof. And a lot of that is because our, pay, our communication and our team working together. So the patients see value in what we're providing. Most of the time I hear, well, how do you convert a patient that's sitting in your chair who's never heard of sleep apnea? Well, we have a protocol and a system for that. And most of the time they're ready to listen to you because they know we've been doing this for a long time and they see the signs and symptoms. So, 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 we have so, so, so walk us through some of these, and by the way, as far as the details, I think it's funny because you're, you're, you're also a business person, no, no doubt about it. And um, in my 28 years, well, I, I did dentist in 87, but I started a, a media company in 94 with Fran Report, which turned into Dental Town. But every single dentist that ever walked in my office and couldn't tell me about what he was doing until I signed an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, um, or, or spent the first three or four years getting a patent. 99% of all patents will never generate enough revenue to pay for the patent. And 100% of all NDAs that I've signed never came to fruition because those are what the idiots do. That it's, it's the idea. It's, oh, I have an idea. I got to protect it. Dude, look at McDonald's. It's on the corner of, four, of the big four lane intersection. They sell a hamburger, fry, and a Coke. Do, do you <laughs> not get it? They got a play area for kids. What is there you don't understand? And how many people have been able to go against them? Maybe McDonald's or Wendy's or Whataburger or, or whatever. It's never the idea. It's never the non-disclosure. Mm -hmm. It's never the patent. It's always the details. People like you and me are operators. We're the ones who get all the little details. Every day we just get up and knock out all the little details. And we mm -hmm. just do it day after day, decade after decade. Yeah. And we just get up the mountain one step at a time. And everybody else thinks it's going to be this this grand idea or this secret weapon or this patent or whatever. And you just well, said it's all the, the details. It's all the implementation. So walk us through some of those details. How, how do you find a sleep apnea patient? How, how does the process work? Well, most of the time we get referrals from physicians and that has been like key because those people were tired enough to go get a sleep study, tired enough to try CPAP and still pursuing treatment. Then we have people that I get from external marketing. Yes, I know marketing is a four-letter word in dentistry sometimes, but uh, I think that we've created a lot of awareness in our town and people asking about sleep. Okay, Snoring. but physicians, are, um, we have nine specialties in dentistry. They have 58. What, mm -hmm. what, what, type of, um, what type of physicians? Family physicians? or What, what type yeah. of physicians are, are, are sending people in for sleep studies? The sleep physicians are kind of on the front line, so I do work with them. And the you know, sleep physicians. Yeah. Now is that a specialty yet? Certified. No, um, it's usually neurologist or pulmonologist. Neurologist or pulmonologist. Explain why. And they why. get board certified. I think that you know, sleep apnea was discovered in the '50s in Germany and um, Spain. But it didn't catch on in the states for a long time because no one knew which specialist was going to take it, right? So I don't know the history of why neurologists and both pulmonologists started, but there became a board certification in sleep. Wow. Well, you know, Americans were still doing ulcer surgeries 10 years after the Australians stopped doing it and treating with antibiotics. And they used to, and there's all kinds of literature making fun of the Australians for doing surgery with an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure there's some jokes about sticking a reverse vacuum on someone's face as well. The seat you're referring to the CPAP? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? Actually, I went on a missionary dental trip in, uh, north of uh, Alcapulco and Audioc, and the dentist that I was bunking up in a room with, I didn't even know he had one on until the morning, and it was, it was actually a, it, a, looked like a little DVD player. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, yeah, they're and, getting so much better. And I don't know if I drank so much I didn't hear it or uh, if it was just so quiet, but I, I wasn't aware of it till the morning when he asked me if it bothered me. And I was like, what well, did what bother me? But anyway, so talk, so, so talk about the, um, um, the, the CPAP well, versus appliance and all that. Well, I do work a lot with the primary care physicians, just to finish that point. Uh, in fact, tonight I'm giving a, a lecture to about 20 primary care physicians, ENT, as well as um, like some of the team members, staff members. And we're going to talk about CPAP and we're going to talk about oral appliances. I'm very blessed 
in my town because the sleep physicians are on board with oral appliances. They read the studies. They know that there's a place for them. First, first oral appliance, if, in, if the patient prefers, in mild to moderate cases, and if they're CPAP intolerant. You know, I always like the analogy that the Industrial Revolution probably could have started 30 years prior. We had the technology, but we had to wait 30 years for all the old managers to die off. To actually, and then the new managers rising up could actually take on that technology and change the world. But I think we kind of have to wait for some of our newer sleep physicians to come on board and realize there's a place for oral appliances. Now, ResMed the world's largest C CPAP maker, a multi-billion dollar company, bought an oral appliance company. And really? They, so give the details that one. Who bought who? ResMed. Uh, the world's largest, they make more money in Res R-E-Z-I? R-E-S-M-E-D. ResMed is the largest CPAP maker. Mm-hmm. And they bought who? Um, they, they have the appliance called Narval. N-A-R? V, as in victory, A-L. And where's that name come from? What's NAR and Val? I, who knows? It's, it's a nylon center. It's like uh, made from a cousin to Kevlar. It's pretty sleek, virtually indestructible. Um, I really like it. It's the one I wear. That's the oral appliance you wear? Mm -hmm. And it's made out of Kevlar because it's bulletproof? So Cousin to Kevlar. Yeah. You know, in Idaho, we have a lot of guys. Because you're in Idaho, all those uh, <laughs> paramilitary... Are, are there really a lot of uh, paramilitary groups in Idaho? It there seems is. like if you ever read about any of them, yeah. they are in Idaho. They're far away. They're not right near me, but I'm sure they're here. Oh, so 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 you don't really see them or anything. It's okay. It's, they're not hurting property values or anything. No. How, how many people live in Coeur d'Alene? Uh, in the county, it's about 100,000. 100,000. Post um, Falls, I, where I practice, is 27. I'll tell you, the, one of the neatest things about becoming a lecturer is to find all these golden things and a lot of the nice places you've all heard of. But the ones that are the nicest that you never heard of is uh, North Carolina, Arkansas, and Idaho. I mean, those are just, and Montana. I mean, I, I oh, mean, yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, there's some of the most beautiful country in the world and all the other beautiful stuff you hear about all the time. But like, who would have ever thought Arkansas was one of the most gorgeous places in the world? They got all four seasons. I mean, God, I went trout fishing for four days with my dad on the uh, White River. I mean, unbelievable. And Idaho is just the buttes and, <laughs> oh my God, I, I could live there in a minute. And my, my very good friend, uh, Lewis Kaur, a uh, Dennis in Glendale, he's doing the Ironman there in five weeks. Oh, cool. And he's, a, oh, he's give afraid. Me number. He, is, uh, he, he admits that he's afraid of clowns, so I'm going to have to have you dress up in a clown <laughs> suit and uh, when, during the marathon, jump out of the uh, side and uh, scare him. That'd be hilarious. <laughs> that would be. You have to do it. He's got 6,000 <laughs> posts on Dental Town. If you could capture that on a video, that would be the biggest joke uh, in my world. But uh, so, so I want to go back to the details. Um, so this person is driving to work right now and, uh, and they're listening to you and they're saying, oh, okay, um, you're telling me we're going to go from the first floor to the second floor. What's the first step, the second step, the third step? What, mm -hmm. what, what would the first thing, if I'm driving to work and I don't even know what apnea stands for and you're saying sleep apnea, uh, what does apnea stand for and what would be the first step? Well, to, the first step would be to get more education so that you're not making snore guards for your patients because what we're doing is far more than, you know, making a piece of plastic for someone. What sleep apnea is or what we treat are, is sleep disordered breathing. And sleep disordered breathing has an range of different types ranging from purely snoring, upper airway resistance syndrome, and that's basically the sleepy snore, someone who snores so much that it interrupts their sleep and they wake up not refreshed. And then there's full-blown obstructive sleep apnea. And I actually was the co-founder of the Latin Club in undergrad in, at Houghton College. And I love Latin. So apnea literally means without breath. Really? So that has, that has to last 10 seconds or more to be classified as an apnea. And you'll, the you'll only way to test it the only way to test it is with a sleep test. Take home or in a facility? Either. So you don't really need a whole lot of fancy equipment or, you know, spend however much 3D imaging is. You don't have to have that to screen or treat sleep apnea. So what would be the fastest, lowest cost, highest quality way to screen? Take home or go to a facility? Uh, take home. Just, I mean, just simply observing the signs and symptoms. 
one in four men have sleep apnea, one in 10 women, and 50% of the population over 50. Therefore, if you do the math, and up to 90% of them remain undiagnosed. If you do the simple math, look how many sleep apneics you have in your own practice who don't even know about the disease. And that's where a lot of my team members have just been so impactful. First of all, I treated their spouses. So they're my biggest cheerleader. And they want to tell everyone about it. We screen in pediatric kids as well. And so all the signs and symptoms, I've you know, kind of taken, taken time to train them as well as like have like a little checklist and all that. And they talk to the patients. So what are the signs and symptoms and what is the disease? I mean, why should I be worried that I have sleep apnea or sleep outside? I mean, what am I, am I going to get male pattern baldness? Uh, am my hair going to fall late. out? Too late. Well, I mean, what, what, what is the disease? Uh, basically, it's repetitive desaturations of oxygen and um, cessation of breathing. So the body needs oxygen. It's, it's the body's number one drug of choice, right? So instead of being able to get into their deep sleep, the brain wakes them up. It doesn't wake them up awake because most snores, most sleep apnics will tell you they sleep just fine. But it takes them from a deeper stage of sleep to a lighter stage of sleep. So they're never getting that deep, restful, or REM sleep. Also, when they're fighting for breath, they're releasing cortisol. They're activating their sympathetic nervous system. The cardiovascular distress that you're putting on your body when it's supposed to be resting, it leads to high, high blood pressure, stroke, uh, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, uh, diabetes type 2 is totally associated with sleep apnea, untreated sleep apnea. I mean, depression, erectile dysfunction, uh, you name it, it's probably related to good sleep or lack thereof. Now, see, I thought a heart disease was from getting your finger caught in a wedding ring. <laughs> but, but you're saying there's other causes. I'm just kidding. So, so now, how? So again, what what are the same symptoms? What are you finding these out of hygiene? Are you finding these? Mm -hmm. You have a questionnaire in the waiting room. Well, you Could can do that. I have posters and brochures and stuff around. But really, it's that conversation. So my hygienist can have. We have their medical history at our finger. Their our fingertips. We see them twice a year. We stare down their airways all day long. In fact, the, the grandfather of sleep apnea in, in the country, who's an MD, said the, one of the most ironic things is that dentists have looked down the throats of sleep apneics for years without even knowing about the disease. Because it's not in dental school. Still not. That's, I almost feel like I'm a, a preacher. I, I want to spread the good, the good news. Therefore, we look at medical histories. We look at their medications. And then we look at the dental signs and symptoms. Mouth breathing, constricted arches, vaulted palate, lingual tori, uh, acid erosion, bruxing, clenching, abfractions, scalloped tongue, t a high tongue level. Does the tongue retract into the airway when they open? I mean, there's just, there's a, about 30 of them that we could look at. But if you were taught, if you went in and, and uh, you're, you're talking right now, B to B, dentist to dentist, if you were given a presentation, B to C, business to consumer, and you, you were given a lecture at some, uh, some church or picnic or, or some gathering, uh -huh. what would you tell lay people the signs and symptoms would be? And then, I, I've done those lectures too. Uh, we talk, I talk a lot about fatigue. And when we talk to a patient, we'll say, do you snore? Right? And they'll say No but my wife tells me I do, or yeah, but it doesn't bother me. So we, we kind of ask further questions because snoring is a joke. Everyone makes fun of it or they sleep in separate rooms. It's not, impa it's not impacting their life per se. So we ask, well, do you wake up refreshed? And many times they say, are you supposed to? Well, yes, after eight hours of sleep, you should wake up refreshed. And then we talk about some of the other, you know, uh, medications or problems they have or do you do you sleep peacefully restfully because a lot of insomnia is actually associated with sleep apnea as well sometimes we're just planting a, sh a seed I like to say I don't should on my patients so I'll send them home with a I'll, I said you know I'll send them home with a brochure give them the information hoping that their spouse or something will look at the brochure and ask them to pursue treatment 
we always set them up for another consult because this is like a long conversation we have to really get people to explain what, how the impact it has on their body and how we can treat them and treatment options. So that's a conversation you can't have in 30 seconds with your hygienist looking over your shoulder like wanting their operatory for the next patient. So then we look into their medical insurance and bring them back for a consult. So Aaron, um, there's a lot of buzz right now. This is, we're sitting here uh, May of 2015. There's a lot of buzz about the new Apple Watch. There's a, all the, there's a ton of articles about um, yeah. the future watches are biomedical, that they might be someday telling you your heartbeat, whether you're sleeping or not. Um, our common buddy, Mike Detola, um, uh, posts on Facebook every day his, uh, his, his sleep score Work. from the night. Uh -huh. and, and, and the one thing he's learned from his smart watch, is, are they called smart watch or biomedical watches? Oh, no. or and so he, he's found out that he can't get a 90% unless he sleeps for eight full hours. So if he wakes up and it's like seven hours, he's going to roll over and go back to bed. He, he's going to get, are, are any of these watches um, accurate of telling you that you're, uh, you're rolling around in bed, you could have been sleeping, you have sleep apnea? No, I, I... I'm a little disappointed that I feel like some people put way too much um, trust in that, you know, like, oh, they say I'm fine. But I think what it has done, which I appreciate, is the awareness of sleep and how it contributes to health. It can't really tell you it has sleep, you have sleep apnea, but it can tell you if you have restless sleep or peaceful sleep. It's not going to tell you how much REM you have or anything like that. Or if it does, it's probably not real accurate. So I do appreciate the fact that a lot of patients are actually more aware of why we're even talking to them and why it even matters. Because Americans are horrible. We have horrible sleep hygiene. And that doesn't mean clean sheets. That means getting 7.7 .7 hours of sleep, going to bed early, getting up early, same you know, um, schedule all the time. So it's brought awareness what, to Americans. Now when, now, when you said America, was that... Was that a joke because you're an American or you actually read compared to other countries, we have worse sleep hygiene? Yeah, I, we really do. We don't sleep enough. And with the advent of, advent of technology, TVs in the rooms, iPhones, iP even reading off of iPads before going to bed can affect melatonin release and affect sleep cycles. So I think we have a lot of bad habits. And I'm, I'm going to write. Before I go, before I uh, um, die, I want to write a book called the, the Giggle Factor because I've lectured to dentists in 50 countries and it seems like the richest countries giggle the least and as you go poor and poor and poor, everyone's relaxed and having fun and giggling. And my God, the Americans and the Germans and the Japs and the Korean, are, ah! <laughs> and then by the time you get to Brazil and Shenzhen and Kathmandu, they're just like, everybody's just so much more relaxed. There's so much less stress. And, and you, when you do that, you see the importance about how you've got to reduce your spending. Yeah. You can't be killing yourself for a house and an SUV and a Rolex watch and a Gucci. It's just crazy. None of that well, stuff is going to make you happy. Well, I laugh a lot. So does that mean I'm going to live long? Yeah. I mean, so, so Aaron, um, um, so I've only got you for six and a half more minutes. So I, I want to change subjects again. So you're this kid out of school and um, um, you, you talked about going to, especially if it's your passion, you talked about uh, things like that. But um, I know you also are big into six month smiles. Mm -hmm. um, I want you to answer this question, then explain six month smiles. If you didn't do sleep apnea or six month smiles, uh, and and you were and you, just, and you graduated five years ago, and you're looking to maybe add more procedures, and you know you could you could be adding you know implants or whatever. Um, tell us about your thoughts on six month smiles, or or would you just call that short term ortho, or what what is yeah. six month smiles? What is short term ortho, and why did you get into that, and was that a good decision? Uh, short term <clears throat> short term ortho, you need to realize what what they're saying about that. It's adult orthodontics for cosmetic reasons in six to nine months. And why I chose that, it's actually a system that's created because again, I'm all about systems and efficiencies. Therefore, a lot of the wheel was already invented and the quality of the product is great. It's clear brackets, white wire, everything's White cosmetic. wire? Mm -hmm. How do you have a white wire? Uh, I don't know how they code it, but it's it, white. Oh, oh it's, it's coated white. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's nighttime. Okay, so it's a nighttime wire. So it's clear yeah. brackets. 
and mm -hmm. it's is it just and it's and it's adult only. Yeah. And it's so, just cosmetic. Yeah, so I have to tell you why I got into it though is I did get frustrated with aligners. And the whole reason I got into aligners is to be honest, I really hate doing veneers. I hate cutting down good enamel. I share when, that passion with you too. When how, can you, how can you be a dentist and want to peel the, the banana on all the teeth? Yeah, I mean, I do them when they're necessary. But if tooth position is the problem, then tooth movement is the answer. Right. And I'd refer these patients off to the orthodontist and they would never go. Or they'd be in braces for two years. And I work, I respect orthodontists. I respect what they've committed and to their, you know, profession. And to be honest, I think you have to do, have to be at the top of your class because the treatment planning part, I think is not real easy. But what we're trying to accomplish with Six Month Smiles is those people in between, the ones that we're going to get Invisalign and get a, uh, or clear aligners and get frustrated and refinement and all that. Or there was instant ortho with veneers. And I feel like with six months miles, like Dr. Detola says, he can put a steering wheel on the tooth and you can move it much more controlled and much more efficient. I've had some as, great as cases. Opposed to, but you said you started with aligners? Yeah, uh, like five or six years ago. And what I what type of aligners? For a long time. I did Invisalign. Okay, I still Invis do. Okay, I still Invisalign. Do. So you're calling yeah. Invisalign aligners? Yeah. A, a, a clear, removable. Clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, because some people uh, aligner might be uh, like an Inman aligner. Oh yeah, 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 I've seen those too. No, I do Invisalign. Okay, so it's Invisalign, and there's and there's uh, some other brands similar. What is it? Clear Choice or th yeah, those I other ones? Okay, but but so you do Invisalign, you do Invisalign, and you do six month smiles. Mm -hmm. So I you do you them. Yeah, there's a place for them, for but sure. You, but you do them both. Not at the same, not on the same person. Right, but but you yeah. but you but you offer for both. Uh -huh. Okay, so when would you do six month smiles, and when would you do Invisalign? I would do six month smiles in almost every case, unless the patient really wanted Invisalign, and that's kind of what my last few cases have been. If it's um, ortho relapse and it's like going to be about five aligners. Then, then Invisalign would be a good option as well. You always have that patient compliance factor. Yeah, and what's the lab bill on the um, six month smiles versus the Invisalign? Is oh, that a factor? That's a, great, that's a great question. It's about a third. What's a third? The, the six month smiles toward the Invisalign? Yeah. yeah. The Invisalign is still a hefty lab bill, isn't it? Yeah, well, they have different you know, categories now, five aligners, 10 aligners, or assist. Do you need help with it? I think okay. that was like sixteen or seventeen hundred dollars for a full case. Okay, so uh, I only got you for uh, so two minutes. So um, well, we we talked about especially um, GPR. You felt that you went to Creighton and since they didn't have a lot of specialists, um, they um, you know you felt like you were ready to go. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna end by uh, throwing you under a bus with the most political controversial question I can ask you. Um, you know, when I was in school in 87, a lot of people that didn't have experience said, well, I'm going to go join the Navy. I'm going to join the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines for four years. Mm -hmm. And I worked down some student loans and get some experience. Today, um, the, big, the most number of jobs is corporate dentistry. What would you say to a, a, a kid coming out of school said, I think I'm going to go join corporate dentistry, get some student loans, and just get some experience. Do you think corporate dentistry is the, the evil nightmare? It's Godzilla killing dentistry? Or do you, do you think that's a place to go? to go do a residency. Um, you know, <laughs> use those patients to practice on. I am very passionate about dentistry and I feel like, especially now that I'm in medical, doing a lot of medical insurance, I do feel like the physicians have let it kind of get taken over by hospitals and, and corporations and lose that autonomy. Insurance the, the, the physicians controls lost it all. everything. Yeah. And as a dentist, I think we can still maintain that. In fact, I'm the, the political action committee fundraiser for the whole state of Idaho because I feel so passionately that we have people working every day on our behalf to preserve what we have. So I do think that some of corporate dentistry can, can uh, take some of that away. What so I you're, you're on the political action committee for the Idaho State Dental Association? Mm-hmm. Okay. So you're raising money to, and, 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 you, and the political action committee is trying to keep 
insurance companies and corporate dentistry out of dentistry? Yeah, we work with lobbyists in the, in the local state senators as well as the ones in D.C. Um, just helping dentistry stay on top of mind and preserve, like I said, preserve. So then what, what would you say to uh, a kid coming out of school that says, uh, Aaron, I got, I got, I got $250,000 student loans. Uh, should I join the ADA? I mean, I, yes, they should. And there is a break for new dentists. I think that we all owe it to our vocation. Again, I'm that Latin nerd. Woco means calling. I think it's our calling. And I think we should not just stick our head in the sand. I think it's really important to, to support it. I've, I've been a duping member of the ADA every year. Mm -hmm. uh, ever and uh, yeah, you know everybody complains about their family or this or that. But when the people complain and then they quit, it's like, well, then 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 who's there? Or I mean, or if I mean, they're I mean if they're complaining about things that are going on, even in, if they complain about the ADA, but they're not doing anything about it, that's when I get real frustrated. If yeah. you don't like your situation, and I just want and I just want to tell the young kids and you you this might be applying to you. I think you're young enough you might have missed it. Do you remember the 1984 Pulitzer Prize winning book by Paul Starr, The Rise of the American Healthcare System? Um, that is one of the few books that I ever had to go back 10 years later and read again. I think the only other Pulitzer Prize I did a reread 10 years later was uh, Guns, Germs and Steel, but the um, you know, in 1900 healthcare was 1% of our GDP and in 2000 it was like 12% and then by our 14%, then by 2010, it was like 17%. And when you, uh, it, it completely explains the entire healthcare system. And then when you travel yeah. around the world, India and China and Brazil are now going through where we were. But basically in 1962, the physicians got in bed with the government in a thing called Medicare. And they got in bed with them at the state called Medicaid. And when you get in the bed with anybody, you're going to get screwed. And that is when they... And they got in bed. So it, it's a game changer. I'm not saying it's right and wrong because it depends yeah. on you a physician, a patient, a government. You know, there's different viewpoints. But I would go back and read that, that Paul Starr book. And, um, but, well, uh, I know we're running out of time. But just to, to go back to that student, I would run the numbers. I, d I did consider, like, helping with student loans because I hate debt. But when I ran the numbers, I could make more in private practice by working my tail off because I'm getting paid on, you know, production or collection. And I can put more in retirement and just extend my student loans because I had 2.8%, you know, finance or interest. So really do the math. It, does it make sense for you? What area, what's your demographic of where you're moving back to? Does it make sense? Do you get to go see the world and join the military and get more practice? Or, you know, do you work for community health for a while? I think that's an admirable thing. Well, uh, we are out of time, and I just want to say uh, thank you for all that you've done. I'm a big fan of your uh, 100 posts on Dental Town. I think you're just <laughs> amazing. Uh, most people um, are probably 55 or 60 when they've reached half of your accomplishments. Aaron, I think you're a rock star. I think you're a role model for every dentist. And uh, thank you so much for giving me thank an you. hour of your day. Thank you so much. And when can we expect an online CE course from you? <laughs> we'll chat. Okay. All right, Aaron. Thank you very thank much. Bye-bye.